Simon. Well, welcome to Black History Conversations. We've got a, a great session today. Um, we're welcoming Ayodeji Adabundi from Lagos. And then we're also going to be um, uh, introducing Hilary, um, who's going to be telling us about some of her PhD research. So it's a great session that we've got today. Black History Conversations started some time back. I'm here in Australia and um, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently situated, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, their elders past, present and future. This land belongs to the sovereign people of the First Nation and was never ceded, always was and always will be. It's our tradition, well, not a tradition, but um, a policy here in Australia that we do pay respects whenever we start a meeting. Then just to, uh, to tell you that Black History Conversations is supported by myself from Learning Links International and my colleague Caroline uh, Sansom, who's here as well, and uh, we might be joined by one of our other directors, Natalie Fagan-Brown. Simon Faringo from Belong Nottingham does wonderful work with the technology and manages to post up the uh, uh, recording every week and we put that on the website. We now have the website address www.blackhistoryconversations.com and Marcia Dunkley sends her apologies now but from Black History Walks Network, Black Heritage Walk Network, Walks Network it is actually, she's um, uh, joining us in and advising and we have an amazing team of um of advisors and uh, we're always looking to welcome others to be part of the team and we're exploring ways to better research and tell the stories of black history african history south and east and asian and european colonial history in the context of wider world history so i have a big vision and you can see the glorious photograph above which is actually the view off my decking where we are in a rental property while our house is being rebuilt after the storm so it's all been a bit exciting here in australia okay so this is marcia's black heritage walks network um just saying here, our Black History Conversations advisory team. We've got Jim with us today. And uh, last week, Sherilyn Haggerty was with us. I've been in touch with uh, Professor Sati Fakchak and uh, a number of others. And David Alston, author of Slaves in Highland. This is also um, one of the founders, but also an advisor from a historical background. Now, this um, PowerPoint is going to be um, put onto the website and so I've got this information um, which just introduces the presentation that we're going to have now. So that was just to get us started. So now I think without uh, anything else we'll ask you Ayodeji if you will uh, formally introduce yourself and explain who you are and what you're doing and uh, how come we're in touch with you. We're delighted to welcome you from Lagos in Nigeria. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. I'm grateful for the invitation, and um, I'm glad to uh, meet everybody here, uh, Robert, Helen, Simon, Christian, Sibani, everybody. Really good to meet you. Uh, hope I'm coming across clear. Mm. Okay, good. We can hear you very well, thank you. Okay, yeah, so uh, I'm IODG Abodunde. Uh, I live in Lagos. Uh, I used to live in Ibadan, you know, and, uh, you know, moved to Lagos about 10 years ago. Uh, I'm an, in, an independent writer and researcher. Uh, um, about 15, 16 years ago, uh, I got into uh, writing and researching Nigeria's Christian history. Uh, early on, at some point, I... I started to search a few things about Nigeria's church history. Uh, and I found out that there was really for the general public, you know, for the general Christian public, I didn't really see much at the time. You know, uh, most of them, were, most of the material was uh, heavily scholarly work, academic work, basically. Not, let me not use the word scholarly, academic work, you know, basically PhD thesis, 
you know, and so forth. And, uh, and so the, the average uh, everyday Christian in Nigeria didn't have access, I would say, uh, didn't know much of, of uh, Nigeria's Christian history. And, but somehow I got into, you know, all the academic work, books and all. And I was really stunned, amazed that there was so much, you know, wealth, so much, you know, of a rich history, you know, and I felt we, were, we had become so disconnected from it, you know, that the values, the thoughts, uh, because Nigeria's pre-independence life, you know, was, was basically uh, to a large extent, you know, a, 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 a British Christian, you know, worldview, you know, to a large extent, especially the South, you know, and so uh, all that, that that had happened, I thought, we need to know this, you know, I felt very strongly that these stories needed to be told, you know, and uh, that's how I got into it, and for the last 15 years, uh, plus minus, that's what I've been doing uh, fully, full time, you know. Uh, so yes, that, that's what I do. I research and write and, and publish, basically. Well, that's absolutely fabulous. Now, um, Professor Robert Burroughs is with us from uh, um, Leeds Beckett University, and he's got a particular interest in the, uh, the next things that we're going to talk about to find out how um, uh, the Anglican um, Agbebi was given uh, how how this story came about. So over to you, Robert, before I trip up. Okay, thanks, Liz. Hello, everyone. It's really lovely to be in your company again. And hi, in particular, Ayodeji. Um, yes. That was a very modest introduction to yourself, if I may say. Um, what you, you what you neglected to say was that your your big book about the history of Christianity in Nigeria is a really important work in the field, um, actually in academic as well as as well as getting across to a popular readership, as you say, it was very well received. And I, and I know that um, the late J.D.Y. Peel, who's one of the very eminent historians of Nigeria, reviewed it and reviewed it very favorably. So um, I just want to Thank mention you. that before we move on. And I know that it's <laughs> actually the background somewhat for you these days because you have moved on. And I think you're a rather prolific writer, aren't you? And you're pursuing a, a number of different projects. Yeah. One of them, and the one that we're hoping to speak to you about today is about Majolo Bebi, um, this extraordinary individual, um, three thinking, radical Christian uh, who lived in a really was born, I think, slightly outside of Lagos, but really is a product of Lagos culture yes, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, the uncrowned poet laureate of Lagos, according to the Reno Conquo, and I think that's absolutely right, as well as being a very important person in the early independent church yeah. movement. I, I, I appreciate uh, Ayodeji that you haven't really been given much pre-warning for this conversation today you did the <laughs> no. invite earlier in the week so Absolutely. I'm going to ask you a few questions but I'm going to yeah. ask them with that in mind and I wonder if you could just start by telling us about Agbebi a little bit more in your your knowledge of his life and what things do we need to know about Majolo Agbebi okay okay thank you very much uh you know when I you know was researching uh I mean the the the, the uh, Heritage of Faith, which is the you know the, the big book that stretches uh, spans you know much of Nigeria's Christian history. Uh, obviously, he was one of the people that uh, caught my attention at the time. You know, that's 10, 12 years ago. And uh, when I finished that work, you know, I couldn't get him off my mind because I thought this is one strange person. <laughs> He, he, this is one strange human being. At the time, for his time, he, he, he didn't fit in. He looked so different. I mean, he was a product of Lagos. He, uh, like you said, he was born in Elisha, you know, four or five hours, six hours away. Uh, but he basically, you know, uh, from about seven, eight and all, but he, he grew up in Lagos. 
and he grew up in the world of what we call the Saros, you know, uh, the Saros, you know, those who returned from Sierra Leone, you know. His father him, uh, had re himself was uh, a returnee, you know. And so he grew up in that world of the Ajayi Crowders, of the Habat Macaulay's and, and all that. But, and so, I mean, he grew up Baptist, uh, uh, first with the CMS and then joined the Baptists. But, but he was, he, from about his early 20s, you know, when we start to have, you know, records about him and all that, he, 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 began, he began to ask questions. And that's what, where, where I think uh, his life began to, you know, take the shape it, it took. He began to ask questions that nobody was asking. You know, yes, I mean, it was that world, electricity was coming to Lagos, uh, 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 Telegraph had come to Lagos. You know, and all that. Uh, everybody, you know, at least the Christian elite of Lagos was dressing nice, you know, suits, you know, lovely. I mean, it was good. You know, some had, you know, horse drawn carriages and all that. And for a young man who was ambitious, you know, that would be a perfect life. I mean, he had everything that he had to just go on with that, you know, uh, and just become a means. He would have ended up like someone like Herbert Macaulay, for instance, you know, who grew up as a grandson of a Jai Crowder and then went up to become the Lagos elite and all that. But he began to ask questions. You know, he was asking himself, okay, uh, why, you know, why, uh, why should we be colonized? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the one of the you know very interesting you know debates he had in Lagos in the middle uh, while the Berlin Conference was going on actually, you know, you know he was asking questions in the debates and he was uh, saying to himself, why why should one nation uh, conquer another nation? Why should one nation uh, you know lord it over another nation? At at that time, uh, because of the history of British. Uh, 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 benevolence, you know, the Wilbur forces and the Tontins and all that, you know, it was generally considered that, oh, this is great. I mean, uh, British influence will just grow and increase and until we become completely civilized, you know, and all that. But he thought to himself, why? You know, and he asked himself those questions. And because he began to ask those questions, Obviously, he came into conflict with a lot of people. You know, he came into conflict in his world. He started to ask himself the question, okay, after a long time of missionaries being in Lagos, for instance, why do they still leave the churches? <laughs> you know, he was like, okay, so why, why does a missionary who's been here, who's leading, who's been leading a church for 10 years, 15 years? Okay, so why? Why are the natives, why are the negotiants, the people in Abel Kuta, you know, why are they not leading the churches? You know, and he began to ask those questions. And one great thing about it, he was not just asking it, you know, from the point of what you would call uh, just a protest. He was extremely well read, you know. He, 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 he was very vast in history. He was very vast in religious studies. He had read very widely, you know, uh, like one of the earlier biographers, uh, Guam said, when he got to the CMS school in Lagos, you know, there was a course in English, you know, that the students would not be allowed to take. But he said, yeah, I, I'd like to take it, you know, and, and, and he got excellent grades. So this was somebody who had who'd read widely, who knew a lot of things. And so he was coming into the argument, you know, from that, you know, from that position. And I think he, 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 he was somebody who abandoned what you call, you know, a career, you know, that would have made him all fine, well, happy, wealthy, you know, and began to push what you call the African narrative, you know, and began to tell himself that, wait a minute, you know, uh, it's not all that bad like it's been described. You know, he could read the text. He could read what was written in London or was written in the US and read in between the lines. You know, he could say, mm, well, yeah, Africa is not the, you know, barbarous people, you know, as much as it has been described. He could read very much into, 
uh, uh, what you know, uh, you know, the the decision to let's say grab the land, you know, you know, and he could say, hey, that's not right, he, you know. And one of the earliest things he began to do, what I consider one of the most important, uh, 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 you know, what he engaged in was that he began to pull apart, make a distinction between what was European and what was Christian, you know. I think that, you know, it, it, because at the time, remember, he was in this world of the Saros. He was in this world of Lagos that was considered the Liverpool of West Africa, you know. And so, I mean, it, it was fine. It was fun. It was great. But he began to make the distinction that not everything European was Christian, you know. And being able to make such a distinction at that time required a lot of discernment. So as it began to pull apart, disentangle for his generation, the difference between what was Christian and what was European, that became you know, a major uh, uh, focus of his career. Until he died, that was what he was struggling to accomplish. In his dressing, in his name, in his, you know, uh, it, it, all over. You know, and another point you know, of his life, you know, that, that, you know, of, which connects him with Hughes, you know, with Reverend Hughes, is that he, he thought, because he, had, he, 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 tra he, he visited Britain in 1895 and visited again in 1903, 1904. And, and he felt it was not enough to give Africans the Bible and say, hey, believe in God and then you'll be fine. He felt it was wrong to see a people who was so far removed from the industrial development of Europe and America to just push on them just the Christian message without a commensurate uh, uh, activity of development of industrialization. You know, so when he, you know, when he read Hughes' book or material or paper or pamphlet in the early, even before he went to the UK, he was struck by his vision. He considered Reverend Hughes a visionary. He had the utmost respect for the Reverend Hughes. You know, you know, they were from different worlds, but he thought, hey, this guy really gets it. <laughs> Well, that's a great answer. Thank you. So yeah. I think that distinction yeah. you've made there between seeing what's European about this culture yeah. and what's Christian about it, you put exactly. that really, really helpfully. Yeah. Clearly, that absolutely nails it, I think. I want to ask a bit more about his time yeah. in Britain in just a moment, if I may. But before that, I wanted to um, ask you about his sort of legacy in Nigeria today, really. You said yourself that, you know, you. I don't know if you first encountered him ten or twelve years ago when you were writing your book, or if, if you'd heard of him before that. Is he known at all in Nigeria today? I suppose partly the fact that you're writing a book about him suggests that we Nigerians need to know more about him. Is he completely obscure? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely, completely. Yes, yeah. yes. That's really um, interesting. So it's only yeah. through your research that you're able to learn something about him. Yes, yeah, I, I, the first time I read about him was uh, uh, through the writing of historians like uh, Imani Layodele, uh, Jeff Adiyajai. I never heard, you know, there's nothing in Lagos. I mean, he did a lot. He was, like you said, he was the crown poet Lorette of Lagos, you know. But if you go through the letter and bread of Lagos, there's nothing. You would not see one simple, you know, but nothing that would connect. You wouldn't come across his name anywhere. So. Completely forgotten, yes. Mm -hmm. Is that because of um, his strong Christian belief and the fact that he actually pulled away from an increasingly materialistic, increasingly sort of literary society and, and went yeah. in his own direction? Is that why? And is that why we then, to the extent that people are known from back in that period, it tends to be people who were a bit more mainstream in their beliefs and attitudes. Is that right? Yes, that, 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 that's partly right. Uh, 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 partly right because he 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 left the mainstream. Uh, he 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 basically struggled, you know, for much of his adult life, you know, try, trying to establish something new. So because of that, that 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 is correct. And another 
the other side of the coin, the other side of it is uh, because of Nigeria's post-independence history, you know, uh, which it's been checkered, military rule, you know. So for, for the last, the assault on history, you know, so for the last eight, uh, 60 years, mm. actually, much of that uh, pre-independence generation was be has been basically forgotten. Mm. All they did, what they did, you know, so you don't feel it, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you somehow miss that connection. Uh, for, for instance, uh, you could walk into a, a Bible school, a Bible college, uh, and where people are studying theology, studying history, uh, they'll be able to tell you more about the history of John Wesley than Ajayi Crowder. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'll be able to tell you more about, uh, I mean, just, just name it, a European, a German, and all that, much yeah. more than, you know, uh, in Nigerian pioneer. So those are the two uh, reasons, yes. Well, it's, it's great that you're writing this book about him then to rescue such an important figure and, and actually one whose, whose story is one of independence, right? That's yes, absolutely. Find him. Yes. Um, now, many of the people who are assembled here today will be particularly interested in Agbebi's time in Britain, in particular in Colwyn Bay, but he only, he didn't spend his entire time in Britain in Colwyn yeah. Bay. Of course, he traveled around in Britain quite a bit. Um, could you tell us a bit about that time in Britain? And have you been able to learn anything of how, how he experienced Britain, what he thought of Britain when he came face to face with it? Okay, yeah, uh, because again, not, not much exists right now, you know, except reports, you know, here and there, you know, about his time in Britain, obviously, besides Colin Bay, uh, but he, he traveled around uh, a lot, you know, quite, quite a bit, uh, spoke, spoke at, uh, he, he attended the Kessel Convention, con uh, convention that year, uh, we don't have anything from that. Uh, he attended a meeting at, uh, he spoke at the uh, Swedenborg Society, you know, uh, he was supposed to uh, attend the International Geographic Conference, you know, but he missed it, you know, uh, so he traveled around quite a bit, you know, uh, but we don't have much from that. He spoke in several churches, you know, and he thought uh, his delivery very, very uh, beautiful, you know. Uh, so from all the reports from the newspapers, we, we know that he was very uh, uh, warmly received, and he thought him very, very brilliant. You know, uh, what did he think about Britain? You know, one thing about Agbebi was that he, even though he was fiercely, fiercely independent, and he believed one country did not have the right to lord it over another. He was very much appreciative of development. And, and he thought it wonderful, you know, uh, the industrial development of Britain. You know, he, he, he uh, and he actually, uh, he, you know, the way he, he talked about it, you know, was he felt more Africans, that's what he said, more Africans, more African youths, uh, to be great for them to visit Britain you know, and see the industrial development. Uh, he likened it to uh, the Queen of Sheba visiting Solomon and the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, uh, he used those two examples that, you know, that those kind of visits that create such an impression, you know, that you go back home and like, who, I've seen something, you know. So he felt that they could go there, not be, lost in it and feel whoops, you know, you know, not be lost in the material uh, uh, nature of it, you know, but see the uh, industrial side of it and how we could help improve life back home. So it was very, very uh, strong about that, that you can go, not be so wild, like, oh, I want to live here forever. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, uh, but take the basics, take the essence of it, you know, and come back and say, hey, let's do this here. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I mean, it was unquestionably, I think, an exciting time and place for the young people from Africa who came over to study yeah. or experience Britain, partly because they saw all of this new stuff, but it was also a great place to meet one another and to meet people from other parts of Africa. And, yeah. and then in London, you've got quite a lot of people from the Gold Coast, from Sierra Leone, who are yeah. meeting and they're organizing and having really exciting conversations. That's possibly yeah. happening in Colwyn Bay to some extent too, I think, at the time that he's there. Um, you said before about his great respect for William Hughes and how um, you know he really valued the African Institute. Yeah. I, one of the things I wonder about is how valuable the African Institute was to him, appeared to him when it was compared to all of those other educational schemes that he was interested in and involved in, including, of course, schemes set up in Africa. One of the problems I think Hughes has is that ultimately what he's saying is that, you know, we, we want to um, we want to develop up Africans so that they can go back home and, and instruct yeah. their own people and lead as educators on their own soil. Well, that's kind of already happening in Africa, um, thanks to people like Agbebi and people in elsewhere in West Africa too. Yeah. And so one of the problems Hughes has then is that um, securing interest from those people who might feel that actually we can kind of do this anyway and perhaps more efficiently if we do it at home. So I guess my question is, how prominent in his thinking was the African Institute or were there other schemes to do with education in Africa that he was even more invested in, even more passionate about? Okay, yes, uh, I think that, that's a great question. Uh, he was, the African Institute meant a lot to him. And I do not know of any, even though uh, he worked with, um, uh, Edward Blyden and others to try to get a, a West African university established, either in Sierra Leone or in Lagos. That didn't happen. Uh, but he, I don't think that there was any other institution that he uh, gave as much attention to, you know, and publicized as much as the Institute. Yes, there was um, uh, uh, the Farabi Institute, Farabi College in Sierra Leone, uh, but the Institute meant something to him. Uh, like I said, he was very fiercely independent, you know, and I guess he also saw that Quindesh spirit in Reverend Hughes. He was extremely independent, you know. He, he, gave, he in one of his statements, he said he loved people, he loved institutions like the uh, Foreign Bible Society who, gave, who uh, gave us water and kept away their buckets. <laughs> you know, he said that, you know, he, he was that kind of person. He was like, uh, he saw most other institutions as irredeemably infused uh, or irredeemably fused with European culture and uh, 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 ambitions. He thought the Institute was, had no such ambitions. He thought the Institute had a pure heart, if you could say it that way. Something that was just like, he saw uh, Hughes as somebody who was, whose heart, whose motives, that's the word, was as pure as his, you know? Uh, he, Reverend Hughes just wanted to do this because he really wanted to do this. And it, there, was no self, there was no vested interest. He saw most other institutions as having a vested interest. You know, he felt that you would say, uh, uh, in, one of his, in one of his writings, he said, uh, uh, those who would tell us to look up to heaven with one hand and then with the other hand, take away our land. You know, so he saw for most other institutions, it was a give and take, even though most uh, gave the facade of just being interested. You know, he felt the days of Henry Venn were long gone, of just that pure motive. And Reverend Hughes was that one person who was a European at that stage, who he felt had that same spirit of somebody like Henry Venn, you know, pure 
you know, pure motives. I think that was that was good for me. That's a great question. A great answer again. Thank you. And you led me on actually. I've got one more question if that's all right, Liz, and then I'll hand it over to you and, and see if other people want to ask questions. But you were using his speeches and his writings there and reminding us of what a, a brilliant um thinker he was but also he's he's so articulate too yes. um brilliant use of words and language in his speech. exactly um yeah. so my last question is a really basic one but is it possible to read his writings today are they accessible to us yes uh the thing is much there are some that, that have survived not all have survived uh i include some of them in my upcoming book uh uh but one major tragedy was that you know his library you know he had a vast library you know but it got bombed in 1920 so obviously much of what he had was lost i mean you know at that point so we don't have too much that was you know that comes down to us you know, because of that tragedy, you know, I would assume. Uh, uh, but there, there's some, you know, uh, scattered all over, you know, this paper, that paper, you know, yes, but there's some that's still accessible, yes. Right, okay. Yes. If I had more time, I would be asking you about the poetry next, because I'm a, a really fascinated by the early poetry as well. I am too. Things again in a very different style to everything else, but I will hold my peace and hope for another another opportunity down the line and hand back over to Liz in case Thank anybody you very has much. Um, got any other questions but i should just say as well thanks so much Odeji, for thank answering you. my questions and thanks thank everyone you. else also for listening thank, you, thank, you. thank well, you well thank you so much that was absolutely fascinating and and i'd love to hear about the poetry but i don't think this will be the first time that you'll be joining us Odeji, and uh, and sharing with us because this is just uh, uh, just incredible and and thank it's you. just just brings such a different reality that we sort of have the impression that, you know, because little boys came to the uh, Congo House first, the African Institute, what I'm fascinated is those adults who came, those discussions, those transatlantic, you know, three continent discussions yeah. that were going on, um, that really, really interests me. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, we've got um, uh, Dr. Christine White uh, with us uh, from Glasgow University, which is great, and uh, uh, a colleague from um, Aberdeen University has had to send his apologies. So, Christine, I don't know if you've got anything you want to ask. Well, thank you so much for the um, this amazing presentation. I'm really keen to read the book when it when it comes out and. Um, yeah, it's amazing how much you've kind of uncovered uh, about this unknown, um, previously unknown figure in a way. And I, I kind of wanted to ask about the influence of, of Sierra Leone and the Saro um, returnees, because like like Rob, I was very <clears throat> struck by the way that you sort of observed how he sort of disentangled Europeanness from Christianity. Yeah. Um, which in which I can see a little bit of the influence of Edward Blyde and maybe and like thinking about sort of African authenticity in yeah. Islam, but also African authenticity in, in Christianity. Um, yeah, and, and I, mean, I suppose the Saros are so often as, assumed to be these um, these black Victorians or sort of little Englishers. Um, and I was wondering, yeah, if you can provide any more context to this, to, to his engagement with like Saro culture in Nigeria, or if it's something that kind of comes up in his writing, like thinking about, about Sierra Leone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Yeah. He, he was, um, he, he was, you know, he, he, like I said, he was very, he was, he was, he was a brilliant thinker and he could have, uh, he could, he had a way with words too, very, very strong. And he could be very strong, you know, uh, about a number of things if, if he was convinced about something, you know. Uh, so, I mean, even though he grew up in that world, uh, sometimes, you know, in one of his writings, he said, well, uh, 
being a black English man, like the Syrian, like, you know, the Syrianians like to call themselves an absurdity, you know, you know, it, it, that's one of his statements. He said it's an absurdity that there is not like a black English man, you know, you know, that's a nondescript. So he, he, he had pretty sharp words, you know, you know, for, for that culture. Again, remember his father was Saro, you know, you know, and uh, but he, he had pretty sharp words. He, he felt um, they were not being authentic enough. He felt there was a, you know, there was a period in which that was acceptable. But he felt that after a time that that should have been checked, you know, that, you know, that there was this, there was this growth and maturity that was expected, you know, and that they couldn't continue this forever. I mean, that's what he was saying that, hey, yes, this is, this was great, but this should not continue. He, he was saying that there had to be a progression that, I mean, we had learned, we've learned, we've grown, we've, we've known a number of things. Now we should move forward. So he had some pretty sharp words actually for the Syro culture. You know, he, 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 he appreciated what it had done, but he, and you know, he suffered for it, you know, because he, he, he came at it very strongly and he was mocked a lot too. You know, he was mocked, you know, for, for you know, like almost for being a nuisance, you know, like for being, you know, yes, that, you know, when, when he stopped wearing, you know, for uh, European clothes and began to wear just the native dress, you know, entirely for the rest of his life, you know, he was mocked, you know, they really they laughed at him, you know, they thought he was just being silly, <laughs> you know, so, so, so he took certain steps, you know, in, during his life, you know, to, to say that, hey, I don't agree with that, you know, both in word and in action. So he looked at the Sarah world, you know, and began to poke holes in the balloons, you know, if you would like. And yeah, I mean, that kind of didn't go up very well, you know, in some ways. That's fantastic. I, I was uh, having a, a search around. Uh, thank you. That was a great question, Christine, because I wanted to ask that one. Um, <laughs> About the Saros, I, I never heard the story of the Saro people. We won't talk about it now because it's your other book and you can come back and talk to us about that and tell us absolutely. if you don't mind. Absolutely. But absolutely fascinating. Um, are there questions that others have got or, um, just at the moment? Okay, well, I'm sure that the, the networking will go on, the emails will be back and forth, and I'm sure we can invite oh, you again. So thank you very much indeed, Adeji. And I hope you're going to stay with us now. Yes. And Robert, yes. thank you very much indeed, because it really, <laughs> Great it, really helps. it really helps when it's, uh, when it's as late as it is here to have someone as knowledgeable as you, Robert, to be able absolutely. to uh, really pull out the, the questions. That's absolutely fantastic. Right, well, we're following on the theme of missionaries now. Um, it's just not a, uh, well, apart from the story of the African Institute, um, where we were mainly trying to focus more on the students who came to the African Institute, and uh, we haven't really looked at the whole story of of missionaries. Well, Hilly contacted me and said that she was doing this research about William and Mary Nib. I thought, oh, that's nice. <laughs> and then you start to learn about it. And it's not just nice, it's fantastic. It's just an amazing story. And I have close contacts with Jamaica. And um, uh, William and Mary Nib were missionaries, Baptist, Baptist missionaries going to Jamaica. Uh, and, and worked in Jamaica, and he's going to tell us in a moment. But the coincidence, well, the coincidence, the lovely thing is, and, and how often things link up when we're talking, is that we're working with a community in Jamaica, um, the North Wales Jamaica Society are working with a community in Jamaica, um, and we're working with the Baptist Church there, the Reverend William Hood. Um, and uh, so that this is, very special for me as well. So Hilly's just, you just got to introduce yourself, and tell us what you're doing with your research. And then next year, you're going to come back and tell us more about it as you've, uh, perhaps we'll get an opportunity to visit Jamaica and to do further research there. So over to you for a little while, Hilly. 
Okay, so I'm Hilly Slack and I'm a mature student at UWTSD in Lampeter, where the William Hughes was educated. So that's a good link there. Um, but I'm from the town of Kettering in Northamptonshire. So I was brought up with the coat of arms with a black man holding broken chains. So we knew that there was a connection somehow with the town to abolition. Um, the name William Nib was bandied around, but nothing much was particularly known about it. And, and to be honest, there's even less known about him now in the town of Kettering. Recently, they've decided to take off the black man with uh, the broken chains from the coat of arms, which is a, a whole probably PhD in itself. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so we are kind of losing that connection as well. So I, I, I thought for my undergrad dissertation, I'd look at William Nib, but my supervisor actually said, oh, no, 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 there's far too much there. That's better for a PhD. So I kind of shelved him until a couple of years ago and thought, OK, just him and his wife seem a little bit different to the normal missionaries. They seem like maybe they weren't just there to convert the heathens, but were setting about setting up a few reforms so they were involved in education and prison reforms and they helped set up the free villages after emancipation um other people have other missionaries i should say have their name connected with the free villages but when you actually delve into william's story you see that it was actually him and a couple of people in britain that came up with the idea um, were, were, but not necessarily the first one to set up a free village so which made me then start to think about well how political was he you know some of these people that he's getting mixed up with in in Britain are people like Joseph Sturge who not only was an abolitionist but he was a big chartist so getting involved in uh, workers rights and social conditions and I don't know if any of you know of the portrait by Hayden of the 1840 anti-slavery convention. If you look at that, it's William Nick, there's two um, black men that are in the picture, one of those very prominent, and sitting right next to him, and I think that one is Henry Beckford, sitting next to him is William Nib, and he's the guy who brought them across. They were members of, they were actually deacons of his church. But also in, in the painting, is a man called Daniel O'Connell. Now this, this has actually only come up very, very recently. I haven't found it in any other historians' books about the Nibs at all. I mean, there's a couple of biographies which tend to be written mainly by 18, like by 1860s they're written and they're written from by Baptists. So they're really pushing the Christian side of the, their work and the missionary side. Uh, and then you also get a couple of Marxists who write about them later on, but that are just like decrying them. And they're, they're just missionaries that were there uh, to lord it over everybody. And they were patriarchal. So, you know, he was called the father, but he was a patriarchal father who still wanted control. So, um, so this connection to Daniel O'Connell hasn't come up at all. And I just went to Oxford to one of the, the Baptist archives there. And I found a little bit more about William and Daniel O'Connell, because in an article in the Anti-Slavery Reporter, it comes out that they were best buds. And William Nib at one time was actually called the Daniel O'Connell of Jamaica. So Daniel O'Connell is called the Liberator of Ireland because he was fighting for the emancipation of the Irish Catholics. So this guy who was told by the Baptist Missionary Society not to be political is mixing with all the political front runners of the 1840s. So what I've discovered is that most people who write about the missionaries and particularly Nib, they hark back to the time before 1832 where he did tow the party line. He didn't, he wasn't very political but obviously things were starting to get to him a little bit. And he came across to Britain in 1832, not intending to be political, but I think something just snapped and he just went, that's it, I can't do this anymore. The slaves are being treated atrociously. We need to get abolition. So he fought for abolition. 
So we then have apprenticeship in Jamaica after 1834, uh, which is worse than slavery. So if you want to read anything about slavery, read, actually read about the apprenticeship system because they were supposed to be free, but they were treated even more atrociously. Um, so William's sort of helping with um, reforms and he's got parishioners coming to him asking him for advice because a lot of the time they needed um, they needed advice at how to work the system, how to deal with the magistrates, which if you haven't been educated, you don't know how to do that. So, you know, that, that, that was part of his, his role in, during the apprenticeship system. And it con he continued with all of these reforms right the way through to his death in 1845. So that, is, that was the main part of my um, PhD. But I've also got a bit of a gender issue with this because Mary, who is a Welsh woman, she comes from Monmouthshire, and we think Pontypool, uh, maybe the village of Bringwyn. So there's the, the Welsh connection there. Uh, I wanted to get a little bit more about her. Um, and I found while I was in Oxford that she's actually in a book stating that she was the first Welsh Baptist missionary. So not a guy, the, it was a woman who was the first, but nothing, apart from this tiny little piece in this book, there is nothing about her. So in Kettering, there is a bust of William Nib. There is a few little mentions to William Nib. In Wales, there is no mention of Mary Nib at all, or Mary Watkins as she was. So I'm on a bit of a campaign to get her acknowledged as well. So, um, but yeah, the, it's the political side that I'm really going down and everything I seem to be reading at the moment is just the politics is being thrown at me with William he wasn't a normal guy I like to think that all of us from Kettering are perhaps a little bit political and a little bit you know in your face um so that's the bit I'm I'm really going down and uh, because apparently so what I found yesterday was he was accused of ha helping the ex-apprentices so the new labourers um, create a political union so trade union so it can't get better than that really that's about where I am at the moment so once it's all kind of correlated and um, I've got my my politician my new Jamaican politician all ready I shall come back and tell you more wow <laughs> fantastic all right questions then for Hillary David, David Elston. Yeah, Hilary, thanks, thanks very much. Can, can I ask you um, what the reaction of the Baptist Church was to his, to his increasingly political involvement? Their initial reaction was to try and put a gag on him. Um, and then they realised that everybody else within the Baptist Missionary Society were, because this is the main committee, were actually supporting him, so they changed their stance and went for um, immediate abolition. So he was vaguely instrumental. Thank you. Fantastic. So um, um, Professor Sir Jeff Palmer would be interested as well because he did the campaigning work um, to bring abolition to a close much sooner. I wonder if, uh, uh, with Dundas putting it off, David, do you think there's anything there with that that link? Well, I, I, I think I, one of the things I'm finding very interesting that I think I've only really become recently aware of is, is what Hillary was saying about how bad apprenticeship was, because mm. because at that point, the former slave owners. I mean, you could argue that under slavery, they had at least some minimal interest in the welfare of the enslaved because that was their labor force. But once you, once you get emancipation, but you've still got people but, um, bonded to, to provide free labor, but they know that's going to end. They, they've got very little interest in, uh, and I hadn't my, my my particular interest, as you know, is in Guyana, and I hadn't realised that there there was 
almost immediately you got into the apprenticeship period, there was resistance to that, and some of the leaders of the resistance were executed. Um, so, so I, 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 you know, and I think there's something about our language. You know, we we so we so readily talk about slavery ending in in 1834, mm -hmm. but really we we should be talking about 18, 1838, and that role of the stipendiary magistrates, I think, is very interesting mm -hmm. as well. I think there were. Um, I think there were there were some I think who were genuinely trying to to do justice, but I think there were an awful lot who were um, who, who paradoxically were both supported abolition but were racist and you know, and uh, uh, and were some of them I think quite appalling. Yeah. yeah. There's a good book from um, Jamaica, so you get a few slave narratives, but the only narrative I've actually found for apprenticeship is one uh, by a guy called James Williams, who Sturge brings across to England. Um, he goes a little bit mad when he comes across here and he has to get sent back because he's been a bit of a naughty boy. <laughs> but uh, the, the actual narrative is, is really interesting because it does show you what apprenticeship was like. Because uh, one of the things I did forget to, to mention was that uh, Another part of my PhD is to actually make sure that the agency of the ex-apprentices is acknowledged because we could talk about how the whites were using the blacks, but the blacks actually were using the whites. Use, you know, if there's something out there that's going to help you gain whatever, you use it, don't you? Um, and William actually, one of the ideas for William's free villages was so that people could get enough land to be able to vote. I had to remember that William himself couldn't vote, but this is something that he's picking up from the Chartists. If they've got enough land to vote, that also means that in time they can have representation on the House of Assembly. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually happen because they managed to change all the rules, but that's what his aim was. So he wanted independent. African Jamaicans. Thank you. I heard Edgy, is there anything that you want to ask Hilly or comment? No, you're okay. Robert? Uh, yeah, well, I'll say some things and I hope it will become a question. Thanks, Hilly. That was really, really interesting. Um, the connection to the Chartists is fascinating because my understanding of that period, which is not as great as yours, but my understanding is that very often the Chartists and the missionaries do not see eye to eye and one of the great chartist sort of rhetorical gestures is to point to what the missionaries are sort of doing and sort of a bit competitively and sort of say well you know they say well am i not a man and a brother then so it sounds as if despite being in contact with the very people who were making those kind of arguments um william nibbs able to sort of navigate that or to appeal to the chartists despite his work as a missionary and i guess that's possibly because of the radical nature of his work as a missionary, but tell me more. Yeah, I think I think you're right. He, I th he's a great orator, which I think is why him and Daniel O'Connell get on so well. And I think maybe because he, he doesn't seem to stick to one group. So I'm a missionary, I'm a chartist, I'm also an Irish emancipator. Oh yeah, and I might get involved in the USA as well, because Frederick Douglass actually mentions uh, William Nibbs in one of his famous speeches. So it's, I think he, he's just very nosy. <laughs> I love your technical terminology. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid I'm not a typical PhD historian at all. <laughs> I'm very down to earth. <laughs> I, I, I thank, you, thank you all um, for, for, for explaining all of this in ways that people who aren't historians and perhaps know little about the, uh, the story will be able to understand because we're recording this and we're going to to keep our recordings. And I know that Professor Satifwakchat, who's just been able to join us, is going to be absolutely delighted to, uh, to have that opportunity. Um, Ayodeji uh, Abundi, um, can I introduce you to Professor Satifwakchat from Joss University um, in Nigeria. And uh, Satifwakchat, um, it's great to see you, you here. So. What I'm going to do is you've actually managed to join us now, Professor Sati. Uh, we've also got Professor Robert Burroughs with us and Dr. Christine White from um, Glasgow University. Um, so 
uh, we've been hearing about the story, oh dear, we can't go back through it all again, but we've been hearing about the story. Robert, would you like to explain <laughs> briefly? Yeah, again, everyone said that the first half today really was um, looking back at, with thanks to Adegio Budunde, hearing about the extraordinary life of Majolo Bebi and um, hearing about his time in Britain, hearing about what really motivated this individual to be such a three thinking, um, three thinking radical person motivated really by a vision of liberation, I think. Um, yeah, really, I suppose also really looking forward to and getting excited about Ayodeji's forthcoming book. That was the first half, I think, of our uh, time today in a very brief nutshell there, wasn't it? Um, so, oh, yeah, well, thank you very there. much. I don't know if I've captured everything, but there's some something of what we talked about. Okay, that's really great. Well, you know, um, Professor Sati, in the past we've talked about the African Institute in Colwyn Bay, um, and there's a link between... Um, Abebdi and um, Reverend William Hughes. So that's why I was so excited. And then we've also had Hilly talking about her PhD work that we're going to hear more about, which is about um, uh, missionaries, William and Mary Nibb, who went to um, Jamaica and were much involved in the Christmas rebellion, which was the final rebellion, wasn't it? Um, uh, well, I think it was the last rebellion before, um, Abolition. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the main one. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Main. So um, I'm not quite sure, um, Professor Sati, if you want to ask a question first, or Ayodeji, maybe you ought to introduce yourself to Professor Sati first if you don't know him. No. Okay. You introduce yourself to Professor Sati then. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Ayodeji Abodunde and um, I'm an, an independent writer and researcher, uh, basically work on faith, culture, and leadership in Africa. Uh, but my focus for many years has been on Nigeria's Christian history, you know, and trying to tell the stories, you know, uh, to a generation that I feel uh, is mainly disconnected from it. Yeah, basically. That's great. So, Professor Sati, how does that fit in with your, your work? Um, I have um, a fairly noisy background here. And okay. I just heard about the histories in Christian uh, missionary history, which yeah. is uh, quite interesting. It's part of Nigerian historiography. And uh, we also teach it as part of uh, courses in Nigerian universities, like a history of Christianity. So, um, but most often we focus uh, on West Africa and Nigeria and uh, missionaries that relate to East Africa, uh, Southern Africa, North Africa. They're not really in the books that we deal with, except those that uh, teach African history. I mean, teach uh, history of religions from a continental perspective. But, um, I've had some little reading about Reverend Hughes, and it's quite interesting how those missionaries of the 19th century, uh, their perception of Africa and uh, the African peoples were like similar, uh, like embedded in the dark continent perspective and embedded in the sinners perspective and embedded in the idea that people needed to be to, to get salvation uh, so um it's quite interesting the work we are doing and i'm happy to uh, be here even though i can let well it's it's great that you've been able to join us I'm, I'm really delighted because you will have an additional resource with this latest publication of okay. iodegis so that that's really wonderful so we'll we'll oh, we'll keep going with that okay so i just have to thank thank you both what i'd like to do now because um um, in consultation with Professor Sati, um, quite frequently asking, what can we do next? How can we best tell what we call in Britain Black history, what is called in America Black history, what is called in the Caribbean Black history, but it's called African history in Africa. 
Yeah. Um, and so we, we've had to rethink our, our way around all of this. So if it's OK with you for the last little part of the session, we'll just begin to have a look at some of the things that we're, we're thinking of doing. So we've got a, a support team, which is uh, Simon, um, myself, David, and um, uh, also um, um, my good friend from the Heritage Walks. <laughs> Just bear in mind, it's uh, past midnight now, so if I'm less than coherent, forgive oh. me. <laughs> um, so, uh, Marcia Dunkley. So, um, we also have wonderful advisors. Helen Papworth has been brilliant this week. We had a really, really long discussion about uh, what we might be able to do and how we can, can move things forward, because it's a very... Uh, you know, it's a time, it's a tipping point. It's a real tipping point. I mean, the fact that Kettering Town Council have changed their, their logo and that statues have come down and plaques have been put on other ones. Anyway, if you bear with me then, first of all, but before I do that, thank you so much. I hope you'll just stay with us a little longer. And when we finish the recording, we've also got time for a quick chat then. Um, so, uh, and thank you very much, Hilary. It sounds absolutely fascinating. And I love it that you can just make it so, so accessible and understandable. And I'm, I'm friends and colleagues, in Jamaica are going to be absolutely fascinated by what we're doing so we'll get you in touch in touch with them right okay all right well we're, I'm really um, proud of the fact that um, uh, we've uh, managed to get as far as we've got with Black History Conversations and I just have to thank Simon and David so much for, uh, for bearing with it as we've meandered through for we're into our fourth season now, so over 50 of these sessions talking about all sorts of everything. So we started this season off with David Alston talking about his wonderful book, Slaves and Highlanders. Uh, so, so informative, you know, the result of years and years of, of research in his communities. Um, then we had a, a week where we looked at uh, the contentious issue about whether the statue of H.M. Stanley ought to stay or ought to be removed. Well, the uh, local um, community voted that it's going to stay, but um, Professor um, Sir Jeff Palmer, who's done the good work in um, Edinburgh, is going to advise them on, on more appropriate wording. So that's, uh, that's going to be good. Uh, Unita Cox talked about Windrush and her role now reviewing the whole um, circumstance of the Windrush scandal. That was very interesting. The following week, we didn't entitle the session this, but I've come across an Australian um, podcast series, which is called The Stuff the British Stole. And it's absolutely incredible. So our session, we were talking about... Um, uh, things that had been stolen from Kenya um, and and we, we discussed other issues but uh, certainly getting a better understanding about the stuff the British stole is really uh, a, a theme that we're following through and um, and colleagues have told us about work that's being done with the Benin bronzes being returned and things. Then we talked about black Heritage History Walks with Marcia Dunkley from Black Heritage Walks Network and David Alston. And that's a really tangible way of, uh, of helping people understand Black history. So that was a really dif different and interesting session, as was the session with Sarah Parks, who um, ha is from a, a, a very interesting, very mixed background and has lived in all sorts of places including Wales and Scotland. She's just launched her book Awakening Legacy and then the following week Bernard Janke who's director of the Jamaican Memory Bank joined us and talked about how they are collecting community histories and um, and that's similar to Professor Sat well similar it's got some links with what the work Professor Sat has done about working with the local community and 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 retelling the history. Then last week, um, Sherilyn Haggerty from the Slavery Studies Unit at the University of Liverpool um, uh, spoke with us, and that was a fantastic conversation. Now, all these conversations are posted on the website, um, and uh, Simon's got, got them sorted. 
belong Nottingham hosts them, but we can access them through the website. So today's been a really great session. Next week, we've got Professor Nick Radburn from Lancaster University. He's going to be talking about arming Africa, firearms and the slave trade. And we're also um, having an opportunity to um, welcome Dr. Gareth Evans-Jones from Bangor University, who was ill the week that uh, I was talking about earlier, the stuff the British stole week, we improvised a bit that week. Um, then the following week, for the first time, we've got someone from Ireland, Dr. Michael O'Connor from Mayo, and he's going to be talking about the book he's written about Mayo and slavery. And we'll also welcome Rachel Lang, who actually joined us last week, um, from the Centre for Studies of Legacies of British Slavery. But she's going to come back in the new year and really explain what we can, um, how that, um, that wonderful database is developing. And finally, before Christmas, we're going to be looking at exploring reparation, this wonderfully contentious subject, but it's something that I'm much involved in. David Alston's involved in a project. And we've got a keynote speaker and author Alex Renton, the author of a book called Blood Legacy, and he is um, also a leading um, investigative reporter for the Times newspaper. His Excellency Seth George Ramakan, the Jamaican High Commissioner, is going to join us if he can, and we've also invited Professor Vereen Shepherd from the Reparation Unit, so we'll be talking about different reparation initiatives that are going on. Um, so in the PowerPoint, which I'm going to post on the website, um, there's more detail about this. Nick Radburn is also a coordinator of the Slave Voyages database, which is a fantastic piece of work. Um, and maybe he'll come again and tell us about that. Um, then I just wanted to share some Black History news. This is Jeff, Professor Jeff Palmer. Um, and he's... Um, uh, um, highly delighted <laughs> and it's a bit ironic really but they had uh, had the Oscars in Scotland for film film Oscars and uh, a film that, that um, was made about Professor um, Sir Jeff Palmer's work and his campaigning to um, uh, re um, retell the story of Dundas or to tell the honest story of Dundas and to leave that statue which is on the top of that tall tall column um so that was fantastic and they they won they won one of the awards so that was absolutely fantastic and and um and jeff palmer's statement we can't change the past but we can change the consequences such as racism for the better is such a profound statement and uh, he's been really supportive of the work that we've done. He's now become Scotland's first black university chancellor. And uh, he's also uh, chair of Edinburgh Slavery and Colonialism Legacy Review Group. So he's just doing so much great work. And this is the new um, wording, the new plaque, which is attached to the Dundas um, Memorial now, explaining that uh, through his efforts, he managed to extend the um, end of um, uh, uh, the eman emancipation, put back emancipation by a, a considerable time. Okay, so there's a very good podcast here, which will also be available for people to listen to um, on Bylines Times. Now, podcast is something we might go into. We're planning for next year, um, Dr. Adam Coward from the um, Royal Commission in Wales going to speak about um, uh, the wool, wool trade and wool in the slave trade and the built environment. Um, Rachel Lang, um, I've spoken to Professor Diane Hall who's going to speak on Ireland's history because we are we found it difficult to, to link with colleagues in Ireland to, to get them. We wanted to have Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, and then other countries around the world. Um, Professor Diane Hall is actually at Victoria University. So I don't know if she knows it'll be midnight when we do the session. So we might have to record it beforehand. And also Florence, 
IEC, who's the Professor of International Documentary Film, uh, would also be really interested to speak. So this information. This is uh, Florence. Her, um, uh, her films include the Bronze Men of Cameroon. Now some of you will understand why I'm interested in, the, in her, her speaking because I, I discovered that um, Derby Museum had a really lovely Black History Month activity because they've got some, um, some things that were stolen from, um, not the Cameroon, um, uh, another West African country, I do apologize, I can't remember. And they were using them for people to, to draw for relaxation exercises. Surprised me a bit anyway. By the way, uh, Bronze Men of Cameroon, and she's also done some of the great, great film work and there's information about what she's done. And she's got lots of awards, so it's a bit like the awards night. So I'm thinking we ought to give awards at the end of this series to uh, recognise the wonderful things folks have been doing. So Caribbean slave owners and other lesser known histories of County Mayo. Got the link there. This is Alec Renton, who's family, his own family um, heritage um, included um, on two sides of his family, um, uh, plantation owners and slave owners, as well as abolitionists. Um, but it's uh, a really interesting book to read. I found it fascinating. They even had it in the library here in Melbourne. Um, so Alex, there's information about him um, and there's also a bylines um, podcast um, where he's interviewed, so get more information there. Now, um, Alex, um, when he was in Jamaica, he met Vereen uh, Shepherd, Professor Vereen Shepherd, um, and she's uh, very active. She leads the Reparation Research Unit at the University of the West Indies, and so we've got a link to a um, program there. And also, I, I was much involved in 2015 in the launch of the International Decade for People of African Descent, not at any high level, but I was promoting it a lot in the work that I was doing then. Um, and so I think we need to, to be looking a little bit more at that. And she's been in Geneva recently at um, a convention there. So there's information there, you'll be able to see about it um, because uh, she, um, she's she been active and. Uh, David, um, you and Donald Morrison um, wrote to some of her urging that one of her first acts in the job could be to send the remaining money from this particular fund um, put together by James Dick uh, back to Jamaica. So um, we'll be following that up, David. I hope you can make that 17th of December session. Right, so a little bit more there about that particular project. Um, I included these two pictures of uh, the High Commissioner, Seth George Roy McCann and his wife, um, when they went to the archives in uh, Bangor University. And the point has come up in the session now is that, you know, why is it that universities and archives in the UK and presumably other European countries have got documents and papers that would be of real value if they could be accessed by people overseas. So it's one of the campaigns of the North Wales Jamaica Society is to try and make this, uh, um, this information available. Uh, we actually arranged for the High Commission uh, team to, to tour Wales a, a few years ago. Just to remind folks who don't know about the CARICOM Reparations Commission, there's things to read up there. Um, and uh, there's an extremely good website, so we've got the link to that, so you can bring yourself up to date if you're not so sure about it. And also the 10 points of the, um, uh, of the campaign. Okay, so this is just us a bit personally, and then I'll, I'll wrap up what with Black History conversations we're talking about is moving forward and rethinking how to tell the stories of Black history or African history. 
and it gets quite complicated when you start thinking about it. But one of the things that it's really important that we recognize is that black British history is different from black American history and black Canadian history. And for those of us who went through black history months over the last 20 years and more, most of the stories that were being told in our black history month in Britain were black American history stories. And we need to recognize that black American history is different and very difficult. Not to say that British black history isn't different and difficult, um, but we want to try and bring out those differences so that um, children here in Britain hear about the story of the uh, boycott on the Bristol bus, as well as the, perhaps the story of Rosa Parks. Um, but we need to make that difference and also to understand about black Canadian history um, because that needs to be recognized as being different from black American history as does African history and Caribbean history as does the black history of the four countries of the UK including the wider black British history and then there's the rest of Europe. This is just to inspire you all because we can keep going forever can't we never mind about European empire building and colonial history. So how, do, how might we go about this? So this is my thinking at the moment, continent by continent. There's a great book uh, was produced in Birmingham for 2007 called The Three Continents. And I think that needs looking at again. Fortuitously, it's now online, so you can read it for free. It's really, really interesting, quite readable. Country by country, region by region. County by county, now that would work well across the UK, identifying county by county, some black history stories and community by community. Because if schools are to be able to tell uh, stories of black history and to integrate that into the curriculum, the best thing is to start local. And I think we ought to take Kettering as the example because that's, uh, that just shows how a community did know about an aspect of its black history. This is specially <laughs> for you, Odeji, <laughs> to uh, uh, tempt you, but this is one of the photographs that we often use. I'm not sure about the legality of it all, but I think we've been given permission. Um, the picture of the Reverend William Hughes and the two young boys that came over who did so much um, to promote the um, African Institute. But we've used this image, it's actually the image on the draft site, which we're thinking of calling just Black History Conversations. It seems like a, a, a brand we can cope with, Black History Conversations. People knows, know what it is. And it's about unlocking Black history and exploring the legacy of colonialization. But we can change the wording. It's just to tell you, we've got a new website that we're working on, but it's not up and running yet. And coming up soon, oh, don't need that one. Here in Australia, there's some real news at the moment. Um, and it's not about COVID for a change. Um, this uh, documentary podcast is about um, Caribbean convicts who came over. There were Caribbean convicts on the first fleet that came over and in settled here. Um, so that's going to be really interesting. But the bit of news that's fascinating that's uh, in the newspaper headlines, and I haven't managed to get it onto a PowerPoint yet, is that we've got an area of Melbourne called Moorland. And they've just realised that Moorland is the name of plantations. I think David may know more about this. Anyway, they've decided to change the name of this area of Melbourne. So there's going to be a whole lot of people with a whole lot more knowledge about, um, about the slave trade because people really don't know that much about it here. So that'll be interesting. And this is all about this thing about Caribbean convicts and who's speaking and how you get the link and everything. So it might be at an impossibly difficult time for you, but uh, we'll see. Right. This is the book that Sarah Parks has just launched. So there's a link to that. Um, we also want to involve Satnam Sangheera at some stage because he's, um, his book, Empire Land, is, is really fascinating and takes us to the 
broaden out what we're doing, certainly. Um, and what was on, that was uh, where, um, it was a few weeks ago, the new books, we're winding up now. Candy Andrews is from a uh, professor from Birmingham University and his book again about the empire sounds fascinating and certainly new perspectives there. And this is the book that was sent to me by Martin very kindly. He was at the launch of it. It's actually a book about um, a character, Mahmoud Matan, in, um, and his, his time in Cardiff's Tiger Bay in Wales. Uh, it's a very interesting book to read and it's very, very well reviewed. So uh, that's great. Anyway, so those that's rattled through a whole lot of things and I hope that was OK. But uh, it gives you a bit of an insight into some of the things that are going on and also what we might be trying to do in the future. So I hope that was helpful. So thank you to everyone again. And Simon, can you wrap up the recording then, please?